Good evening and welcome to the first Wild Live from the Wildlife Trusts from 2022. And have we got a cracker for you tonight? This is about species reintroductions, bringing nature back from the brink. And we've got a fabulous panel to discuss this incredibly interesting topic. Species reintroductions, they often cause some of the most excite greatest excitement in species conservation. They get people engaged. They are such a kind of shooting star, if you like, for what can be achieved about putting nature in recovery. But often they also cause the greatest controversies as well. So we're going to be discussing all of those tonight with this great panel. I'm Craig Bennett, I'm Chief Executive of the Wildlife Trusts and across the Wildlife Trust we're very excited about bringing nature back. That is our big goal, our big focus over the years ahead and species reintroductions are very much part of it and we'll be learning more about that. But first of all let me introduce you quickly to our panel and then I'll say a bit more about each person in turn as we get to it tonight. We have Rob Stoneman, who's our very own Director of Landscape Recovery at the Wildlife Trust. We have Sally Holt, who's Project Lead of Ex Situ Wildcat Conservation at the Wildwood Trust. We have Misha Nestorenko, who's Rewilding Program Manager at Rewilding Europe. And we have Marina Druga, Program Manager at WWF Romania, uh, Romania for the reintroduction of bison. And we have Derek Gao, reintroduction expert, farmer and author, not least of that book, Bringing Back Beavers, Bringing Back the Beaver. So a fantastic panel to get into this uh, topic tonight. And I'm sure uh, you'll be very interested to join in. You can do that, of course, by submitting questions and comments via the YouTube chat at any time. And then I have a team behind the scenes who try and praise them for me uh, and uh, summarize some of those questions for me so that we can get as many of those questions as possible to the panel while we're live tonight. So let's get into it. And we're going to start with our very own Rob. Good evening, Rob. How are you doing? Hi, Craig. It's nice to be here. Good to see you. So, Rob, um, why don't you kick us off? Just give us an overview of what species reintroduction is, what they do species need reintroducing and why is it so such an impactful tool when we're talking about clean nature in recovery? I think I mean there's loads of reasons why I'd want to reintroduce species but I'll, I'll give you four that I think are really important so you know first of all you know if we've lost species from our our, our islands or wherever it might be um, you know there's an essential rightness in bringing it back it was quite interesting I was chatting to Simon Jones who was the project manager for the Scottish Wildlife Trust Beaver Reintroduction Project in southwest Scotland and he talked about, you know, the moment that beaver was released, you know, and this was the first mammalian reintroduction in uh, in the UK. So incredibly exciting moment. But what he felt, what his overwhelming feeling was that, that this beaver belonged in this environment. It was back in the UK. It was essentially right in that Scottish lock. Second reason that some species are really keystones. And, you know, so this concept of keystone species, if you pull the keystone away from an arch, the arch collapses. So some of these species are really important in terms of, um, you know, holding an ecosystem together. A British peat bog without sphagnum moss um, just simply erodes to nothing. You know, we absolutely have to have that keystone species back into that system. The second reason, and it's, you know, sitting here in York tonight, um, the park at the bottom of my road is completely underwater as it is nearly every winter. And that's because it's flooding. And some of these species can do things for us um, that are expensive for us to do otherwise so you know we're at the end of my road i've got part of that part being tarmacked over because the environment agency is storing its equipment there because it's building new flood defenses in york it's spending nine million pounds to protect about 50 houses as well great for those householders of course but there's a a, a, a hydrological engineer that will do that for free and we call it the beaver you know beavers will at scale for free give us that flood defences that we need. That's the sort of ecosystem engineering they can do. So that would be fantastic. And then the final thing is that people absolutely love it. You know, it's just fantastic to have some of these uh, species back in our environment. So, you know, it, you know, I mean, I went to see, Marina will talk about later, but I went to see the bison in the Carpathian Mountains, Romania. You know, so these are the bison, the first time they've been back for 350 years in Romania, you know, and, and we, we tracked them all day long and you know when i saw those bison you know my heart was pounding out of my out of me it was just so exciting to see you know an incredibly big european animal back 
in Europe. Fan just fantastic. Excellent. Thank you very much, Robert. Tell us a bit more about what the Wildlife Trust are up to with respect to introductions. I mean, what have we done at the Wildlife Trust on species reintroductions and what might be around the corner? Yeah, I mean, we've been involved in species reintroductions for really a very long time. I'll give you a nice example. So um, the Chats Moss complex. So that's a massive peat bog that used to sit in between Manchester and Liverpool. It was so big, you had to float the first passenger railway in the world across it on faggots of birch, um, the Manchester to Liverpool railway. So, you know, an enormous peat bog almost entirely disappeared and disappeared with it some of the special wildlife that was associated with that peat. And one of them, the large heath butterfly, um, called the Manchester Argus butterfly in, in that part of the world, uh, was lost. So the Lancashire Wildlife Trust has rewetted some of those remaining peatland patches and brought back the Manchester Argus. And in some ways, that's just like a like a bit of a nothing thing. In another way, the Manchester Argus is as much a part of Manchester as the Manchester United is or Man City is. I'm not taking sides. Um, so, you know, fantastic to have a butterfly like that back in. And we've seen um, lots and lots of those sorts of things. You know, so the large blue butterfly lost, completely extinct in the UK, um, brought back by, for example, the Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust and the Somerset Wildlife Trust. And again, it's just as important to have that large blue back on the Cotswold Edge environment, you know, as it is to have those Georgian townhouses that are, you know, a, a characteristic of places like Bath and, and Cheltenham. Um, but we need to think bigger than that. We need to think about some of those keystone species. So, you know, bringing back the beaver, I think, is an immensely important, um, uh, will be an immensely important achievement. The Wildlife Trusts have been are responsible for bringing it back in Scotland, um, have been responsible for the Devon Beaver trial, where we've had uh, looking at how we can re, you know, how we can involve communities in bringing back um, beaver. And um, we've got lots and lots of caged beaver introductions, we're really testing how we bring beaver back in the UK. But, you know, having worked in mainland Europe for a little while, where there's beavers all over the place, um, you know, really, we need to move well beyond that. I'm sure Derek will talk about it. But it's, you know, we need to get beavers out of the cages, we need to get free living beavers, uh, into every major river system in the whole of um, of of, uh, the, of Great Britain. So you know, let's let's get on with that. Um, we're looking at white-tailed eagles, bringing them back to Wales. That would be really exciting, particularly into Severn Estuary. Um, and we're just gently starting to test the water about how we could bring lynx back into uh, the UK as a as a top predator. Really important to get some of our top predators, which have been almost entirely lost from the British Isles and get them back into the system. And again, I think Derek will have quite a bit to say about that. Great. Thank you, Rob. And I'm going to fire the first question at you tonight uh, that has come in. It's from Graham Gill. And he's asking, is there a danger that over concentration of reintroductions will give the impression that the nature crisis is easily resolved? What do you think of that, Rob? <laughs> Look, I mean, it's just one part, you know, species, you know, so one of the, and this is going back to this, con this, this concept of keystone species. One of the reasons that Britain is one of the most depleted nations on earth in terms of its wildlife. You know, so we've lost more species uh, a, a more abundance of species, um, you know, quantity of species than pretty much any nation on earth. Maybe because we were one of the first to industrialize, maybe that we just managed our land really, really badly. Um, but if we don't have some of these keystone species back, we will never be able to, um, to rebuild um, wildlife in this country. So it's a really fundamental part of the jigsaw puzzle that is nature's recovery. It's really not easy. Um, this is not easy stuff. It's expensive. It's not easy. So I don't think these are any easy solutions about bringing wildlife back. Go on, Derek. We're having we're having problem of sound from Derek. Unfortunately, I I can hear him, but unfortunately, um, I'm being told that you can't hear him on the outward feed. So sorry about that. We're going to try and sort that, and obviously, well, you'll be hearing more from Derek later. We will try and fix that. In the, I'm sure we can fix it, Derek. It's fine. We'll sort it. 
Um, but um, uh, let's move on then. Thank you, Rob, very much for kicking us off there uh, and, and starting the conversation. We're going to move on now to Sally, Sally Holt, who's project lead of Ex Situ Wildcat Conservation at the Wildwood Trust. Um, and uh, is lead for the captive management of the ex situ breeding facilities for the European wildcat and for reintroduction project outside of Scotland. Now, Sally, just very quickly to kick us off, because perhaps not everyone would fully understand this. Tell us the difference between ex situ and in situ conservation. That's a, a, just a quick, quick one to start off so that you can understand your job description, as it were. That's okay. So my role at Wildwood um, is doing all the conservations of in a captive environment. So I'm, my role at the moment is breeding, is going to be breeding the wildcat in the captive environment, whereas in situ is all the work that's being done in the wild. Right, just so that everyone understands that. So Sally, tell us more about your work on wildcats. I mean, beautiful, beautiful animals. And uh, what, what do they contribute to UK biodiversity? So a bit like um, Rob was saying at the start, wildcats used to roam all over Britain. At the moment, they're only found in the highlands of Scotland. So, you know, I think in my opinion, they, they have the right to be here. And unfortunately, they went extinct in England and Wales towards the late 1800s, uh, mainly down to human persecution um, and, and were hunted and suffered a lot of habitat loss. So we know that they can exist outside of Scotland with the right habitat. Um, so definitely need to be here and can be here based on that right habitat. And all the um, the wildcat would help restore a balanced ecosystem as well. So they would prey on um, a lot of numbers of small mammals, um, small rodents, keeping them in check. And they would also be a, a good competition for other predators like foxes as well. So they would help restore a balanced ecosystem. Great, thank you. And so what do you see as the opportunities for wildcat reintroduction here in the UK? So can you repeat that? What do you see as the opportunities for wildcat reintroductions? The opportunities for wildcat reintroductions? Uh, yeah, here in the UK. Pardon? In the UK, what do you see as the opportunities? Oh, just that they absolutely can. We can teach people about these cats. They used to be here. They they will keep these um, populations of prey in check as well. And um, they'll restore a balanced ecosystem. Um, Sorry, but I didn't quite understand your question. Cats being successful over all their particular oh, I regions. That, I yeah. So we have to make sure that the right habitat is, is established and the right social feasibility studies are being done to ensure that we can find the most suitable areas. Um, and that's basically what our project's doing at the moment. So we're, we're trying to find the right areas for these cats to be reintroduced. Um, and so until those so studies are done and the data comes back, it's difficult to exactly determine where the right area will be. But that work is currently being carried out for our project. So we know exactly where the wildcat will do well in the right area um, and hopefully um, exist and disperse with little human intervention when we get the right area located. So that work's currently being done for our project. Great. OK. One question we've had come in, Sally, from Gary Cragg. Um, how do you stop interbreeding with domestic cats, with wild, wild cats? OK, so as long as you have enough population of wild cats, they should not choose to breed with a domestic cat. So it's ensuring that the, the site that we choose to release our wild cats into, we, we need to make sure that we release enough wild cats that they choose their, their own species rather than domestic or feral cats. And obviously making sure that the surveys that are done prior to release um, look at the number of domestic cats in the area or feral cats. So basically making sure we're choosing areas where there is little, if none, um, presence of domestic cats. So really trying to, to mitigate that risk of hybridisation with domestic and ferals as much as we can. But as long as you release enough wild cats, they should choose to, to reproduce with their own kind. Okay. What's it like? I mean, it, it must be um, when you've got sort of wild cats in front of you and you're uh, running through this the breeding programs and so on, Sally. I mean, they must be. How do they compare to domestic cats in terms of temperament and so on? Yeah, so the, it's given in the name. Wild cats are exactly that. They're wild and they have this 
quite ferocious, feisty attitude. And there's there's a couple where I work where they uh, they certainly chase you out the enclosure. You can't be in there very long. Um, but you know, even even though they can be like that, they have an, another side to them where they are very elusive and they do keep away. And it depends on the time of year. So, so during breeding season, yeah, we find that our male wildcats that that sort of feisty and protection um, comes it sort of goes up a notch, and they're even more protective of their territory. And you can't be in that enclosure very long. Um, whereas on the whole, I'd say the majority of the wildcats I work with actually tend to, to shy away or, or rest up high in their enclosures. Um, so they don't really want to be near you at all. And it's so that attitude, that sort of feistiness is really only heightened during breeding season or certainly when our females have kittens to protect as well. Great. All right. Well, Sally, thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating to hear about that. And we're looking to get into it more uh, during this discussion tonight. But thank you. And I personally am incredibly excited about the thought of wildcats returning to a, a wider range in the UK. It does feel like there are hugely important species that's missing from big bits of the UK where they should be present at the moment. So um, anyway, great to have heard uh, that discussion. Let's move on now to Misha uh, Nestorenko, who's with Rewilding Ukraine, uh, a program manager at Rewilding Ukraine. Misha, good evening. Great that you can join us tonight. Thank you very much. And where are you joining us from out of yeah, interest? A very good evening from Odessa, Ukraine. Odessa, great that you could be joining us tonight. It really is. And uh, wonderful to be talking about uh, uh, wildlife in Ukraine at this particular time. I think that's incredibly important. So thank you so much for joining us. Now, you've been doing incredible work there uh, with Rewilding Ukraine as a team leader on the Danube Delta, and you have this amazing vision for a wilder Danube Delta. Please uh, tell us about that. Well, there's a number of things. I mean, Danube Delta, what most of the people think is a kind of fast wilderness area. I mean, it truly is, but many things have been damaged in the 20th century after the World War. A lot of land was reclaimed. And a lot of wildlife has been gone. I mean, in the wildlife, some of the species have been exterminated in the 19th or 18th or 19th centuries. So where we are, I mean, it was still a lot of wilderness, but the first priority for us is kind of bring back the swathes of the delta at scale. I mean, there's lots of floodplain areas that were uh, converted to agriculture. Now there's a momentum to get it, to get it back to the to the river system. And secondly, we what we realized that by exterminating many of the species, we inflicted huge changes in our ecosystems. What was rich meadows full of geese and wildlife birds and wildlife and waterfall, they're now just reed beds and then the biodiversity is gone. And it's all because this balance, these large animals have vanished from our landscape. And uh, after the vanishing of the land of the wild bird, of the wild herbivores, sorry. Uh, our farming has declined in the end of 20th century. So what we have for the first time, we have these large landscapes without the large herbivores, which are important elements of the landscape. So our work is kind of twofold. First of all, bring back the lands to the Danube. And the second is to bring back the keystone species who are architects of the landscape. Keystone species, one of the ones that are most important to get those ecosystem processes working again yeah well like most of the projects in, across the europe we have to use some of the domestic species to replace the extinct animals like for instance the we know our rock were important but we don't have it anymore in our ecosystem so we use uh, the water buffalo some of the local primitive breeds of cattle to graze reed beds and meadows in the delta because just, just there were important elements once the cattle farming stopped meadows just disappeared in the Danube Delta. And then we move on. I mean, in, in the steppe areas, the wild uh, animals like Kulan, which is a wild donkey, were as important as our rock and our ecosystems. Unfortunately, Kulan still survives to the present days and even in Ukraine in some national or uh, national parks and protected areas. And we're releasing it for the first time into the wild. And we're watching how Kulan fits into the step areas which were starting just off the water so okay and what so what are the biggest difficulties particularly when you're trying to do it at this scale well first of all um getting enough area i mean 
for the reintroductions of these large animals, you have to have some meaningful sizes of the areas where animals can establish their normal social lives because they're not just the individuals. I mean, they have to bring, establish their families. They have to live their normal life. They have to migrate a little bit. So you have to have the proper size of the areas, normally like at least thousands of hectares. And for Kulan as well, the second thing is, of course, the attitude of local communities and people where you have to really kind of work together with the people. And very often and there's a lot more excitement and, and admiration of of bringing back the wildlife rather than conflicts. In our cases, of course, we're not talking uh, uh, ferocious predators. In our case, we're talking about reintrodu reintroducing some very exciting species. And with your uh, Danube Delta project, you're working across the boundaries of three countries, aren't you? Ukraine, Moldova, and Romania. I mean, is that is that easy? Is that working well? Is that are there difficulties involved in that? Yeah, there's certainly there's lots of difficulties and, and, and political different difficulties and policies are different. And, and Romania being in the EU and lots of cap subsidies that makes some of the rewarding projects frankly speaking, difficult. There's, there's lots of overgrazing in the land still. Land. I mean, there's no market mechanism apart from EU subsidies for using some of the land that we're restoring on the Ukrainian side, just because there's no cap subsidies. We don't compete with the subsidy system. We compete kind of with the pure benefit of rewarding versus the degraded agriculture, which is in our case is kind of easier. And in Moldova, there's lots of interest to what we're doing as well. We're starting some, some of the first talks and modern on side on, on, on bring back the large herbivores as well. Great, fantastic. Um, we've had lots of comments already coming in. Joe Rose has said, I find Ukraine fascinating in terms of wildlife reintroduction. Done a lot of reading about the Chernobyl exclusion zone and how animals are now thriving in this area. Amazing work. So interesting. Um, uh, so lots of comments already coming in. Keep them coming in and I will try and uh, read them out and get many of them out and questions out to the panel as we go on tonight. But Misha, thank you very much. You've described it very well, but you've also given us a video uh, to show about the Danube Delta rewilding project, uh, which I think will help us understand it even better. So let's have a look at Going to hold you back. I'm not going to hold you back at all.
isn't that extraordinary what a beautiful place absolutely beautiful place and incredible to hear about a project at that scale very exciting so let's go next to marina druga who's a program manager at wwf romania for the reintroduction of bison a big program there um, marina tell us more about your work reintroducing bison um, thank you very much uh, first for inviting me par to participate to this uh, event. Uh, I'm very glad to share uh, about uh, our work with um, uh, you. Uh, before um, telling you more about our work uh, in the Carpathians, I just want to say that um, uh, it's quite important to know that Romania is one of the European countries uh, considers, uh, considered to have available habitat of significant quality and quantity for bison reintroduction, with 50% of the Carpathians mountain range, which is considered basically a stronghold for European bison, and one of the only places where, where a viable metapopulation might exist especially with recent trends of declining human pressure and the reforestation of um, abandoned farmland. Uh, so um, we possess a huge network of protected areas, including natural and national parks where hunting is forbidden, uh, and Natura 2000 sites, which represent 23% of the uh, surface of our country, with large wild areas, with little human activity, and also uh, with large areas of old growth forests from Europe and still wild rivers. Um, as uh, Rob uh, said before, a European bison is considered a keystone species, which plays a very important ecological role in the landscape. Um, and that's the, uh, the reason why we have considered to reintroduce um, uh, the species in the South uh, Western Carpathians. Um, we started to prepare the ground for our work in 2012. Uh, in partnership with Rewilding Europe. So this is a program which is implemented in, in partnership with Rewilding Europe. And I, I'm also the team leader for uh, Rewilding uh, Southwestern Carpathians. Um, we have prepared the ground for about two years, discussing with key stakeholders in the area, um, doing a lot of communication at local level, especially. Um, and then in 2014, uh, we uh, managed to prepare the ground for the first uh, bison translocation. Um, and the first release into the wild uh, was done in 2016. Uh, because a bison, it is uh, a, an ecosystem engineer uh, that contributes basically to uh, increase the, uh, to maintain the mosaic of um, ecosystem uh, and bringing back uh, the biodiversity, uh, we consider that it's a key um, to improve the quality uh, of the ecosystem in the Carpathians. Uh, it is a very complex um, project because um, it involves a lot of uh, aspects, social aspect, economical aspect, ecological aspects, um, uh, and it's it's a lot. We can discuss a lot about uh, about this complexity during this uh, panel. Great, Marina. Thank you very much. I mean, you know, it, bison are incredibly sort of exciting animals to picture and think about the role they play. But I mean, obviously, they there's obviously clear perception they can be dangerous many people will be scared about them. Just tell us a little bit about, you know, your work with communities around this to, to try and build that kind of community support for bison reintroduction. Um, okay, uh, this aspect, it's, uh, I think it's uh, very, very important and we took it seriously since the beginning of the project. Uh, first of all, because as you said, it's Bison, it is a big animal, and uh, people sometimes can be scared. Uh, even uh, we uh, try 
to communicate uh, with people as much as possible since the beginning of the pro uh, program, explaining them a lot about bison ecology, um, um, presenting them how to behave uh, around the bison. We have a lot of information on our website about this, including a movie, how to be behave around uh, the bison. Um, and so uh, in order to increase the acceptance of the people toward bison, we worked with the community uh, side by side by creating um, economical opportunities for them. Um, and so, uh, of course, there have been a lot of challenges because, um, you know, that's a rural community. People uh, have, um, um, most of the people have a difficult life um, and uh, uh, they don't have time to be involved um, uh, or other opportunities to be involved in such kind of economical uh, activities. Uh, but we um, started to create uh, for them these opportunities, um, bringing them uh, knowledge, increasing knowledge, increasing uh, skills, uh, bringing back traditional skills, um, um, showing the value of uh, uh, traditional and social aspects uh, uh, in the area. So basically, uh, we have uh, built uh, with, together with people, with local people, with local authority, um, a social enterprise, in the area under which umbrella it's called we wilder under which umbrella um, all kind of uh, nature friendly uh, activities uh, economical activities started to have to take shape including ecotourism uh, related to bison but also uh, to add about other wildlife like watching or following bear or um, a chamois, um, going in the night uh, for wolf hauling and so on. So uh, bringing this to the people at national level and European level through European Safari Company. Uh, so we um, uh, in, improved, uh, you know, the connection of um, the area with tourist trails. So now we have two official tourist trails and three bike trails in the area, which are included in our um, in the community offer offers to the tourists. Uh, of course, this is a very nar narrow niche. Uh, it's not for a mass. Uh, tourism. Uh, you cannot go there in the field with 20, uh, 50 people once. It's, uh, it's just with small gro groups because it's also about offering to live the experience of the area, testing traditional food, uh, going and participate uh, to workshop and learning how uh, people are cutting hay or uh, working on the agricultural lands. And uh, uh, that kind of activity we have been uh, worked uh, since the beginning of project. Great. Well, Marina, thank you very much. I mean, there's a lot of interest coming in here. We've, uh, you know, people saying uh, the European, uh, Michael has said the European bison is an amazing animal, absolutely fascinating. Lots of questions coming in, which are put to you and the rest of the panel a little bit later on. Um, first of all, though, uh, just to build on what you were talking about there, we have a video from you looking at community reactions to uh, introducing bison in Romania. Let's see a bit more of that. Și tot omul a făcut ca zimbrii să plece. Reîntoarcerea zimbrului în libertate este o oportunitate imensă. Păi, pe mine personal și comunitatea, eu zic că a fost influențat în bine de venirea zimbrilor, pentru că poate noi nu ne-am dat seama de frumusețea zonei. Documentele atestă faptul că familia mea, strămoșii, erau în zonă de acum mai mult de 600 de ani. De acum 600 de ani, de sigur, erau zimbri în zonă.
Oh, Marina, that's a beautiful film. But I mean, it is actually just a trailer, isn't it? There's a longer version, 10 minute version. Yeah, um, it is a 10 minutes version available on the website of WWF and Rewilding Europe. And uh, I am proud to say that it was nominated to 12 uh, festivals in Europe. So, and uh, it won a prize, including. Excellent. And I have to say, it is just beautiful seeing those bison sort of running across the, going across the hillside there. Absolutely spectacular. So, Marina, thank you very much. Just wonderful to see that. And I should add, of course, I'm sure you've heard this. Uh, in fact, Andrea Scheiber has. Uh, she's commented tonight, bison are coming to Kent very soon. Yes, of course, we are very proud about how Kent Wildlife Trust is, uh, has got plans to bring bison back to uh, the bleen, to, to create a wilder bleen in Kent, uh, to really make sure that it's bison performing ecosystem services and ecosystem function in bleen in Kent, uh, rather than necessarily chainsaws uh, as best they can. And those will be reintroduced this year. So stay tuned to Wildlife Trust to find out more about that. We were making sure that there'll be a lot of publicity about that when that happens in just a few months time. And then we'll be able to see bison in this country as well. They will, of course, be uh, in an enclosure, a big enclosure, uh, because that's obviously what's needed in terms of the licenses at the moment to do that and to, to manage certain issues. But at least we'll start to see bison uh, performing those ecosystem functions, hopefully. Uh, and uh, with that pioneering work from Kent Wildlife Trust. So we're going to move on now to Derek, Derek Gow, who will be known to many of you. Derek lives on a 300 acre farm on the Devon Cornwall border, uh, which is in the process of rewilding and where he has captive breeding facilities. Play Derek has played a significant role in the reintroduction of Eurasian beaver the water bowl and the white stalk in England and is currently working on a reintroduction project for the wildcat and a book on our lost walls and I'm sure many of you will also know about this uh, amazing book bringing back the beaver as well. Derek good evening thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much indeed Craig. What would you like and me I to say? I'm, <laughs> I'm reliably told I'm reliably told that we've got your sound fixed now so it's not just me and the panel that can hear you but hopefully all the audience as well. So um Derek, tell us a bit more about the breeding programs on your farm in Devon and, you know, um, just give us uh, some of the updates. What's the latest that's happening? OK, well, in the old days, people would have tapped the microphone to make sure it is working. Can you hear me, Craig? I can hear you. I could hear you all along, Good. Derek. The panel could hear you, ah, but we were told... Right, that that's we were fine. Told well, what's happening couldn't. here? Well, I've just had a charming meeting with Natural England this morning. We are going to rewild 300 acres of the farm here. We've, the ring fences are up. We've, we have some challenges. But at the end of it all, we will have an area that starts to decide its own fortune um, beginning this year. Um, there will be reintroductions here of a myriad of species, from harvest mice to water voles to grey lag geese. And though we will not save the world by doing so, what we will do is we will at least set an example. I don't want to say much about beavers. At the end of the day, for those of you who are interested, buy the book, and, and better than that, buy the book that's out by Rasheen Campbell Palmer and Frank Rosell, which is, is dedicated and serious without jokes. It's tedious. But everything you want to learn about a beaver is in that book. They are the genesis of life. I want to go back, because you couldn't hear me earlier, to what Graham Gill said. And I hope he's listening. Graham, we spent that afternoon in your smelly van with your socks just steaming the windows up needlessly in Kielder 15 years ago. We talked about beavers, we talked about water bowls, and you're right, mate. At the end of the day, we're going to be very, very careful. This enthusiasm that's growing for reintroductions, which are complex, does not mask the fact that we are losing biomass in, 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 in a way that's horrifying. You know, 74,000 yellow hammers down, wood mice shrinking, field vole shrinking. It's not just about reintroductions. It's about nature shutting down. The reintroductions 
are different things and they fall into different categories. So there are creatures that you can put back into an environment like beavers that basically are, are, are dynamos. As soon as you, if you live in a house that's got an old boiler system and one day you walk past that wee flame and you decide to blow on it for a bit of a laugh just to see what happens and it goes out then the rest of your house is here. Everything's here, the bricks and the walls, the pictures are there, you know, you, you can switch on the lights. But the point is, it's stopped functioning. And what beavers do is beavers basically reignite nature and give the opportunity for every guild of life there is to re-exist. And if you don't believe that's true, then you're an idiot. There are no two ways about it. There are plenty of people who will argue that it is not so but they're functioning on less than 50% brain capacity. And it's probably best that they get their carers in soon. When it comes to other species, they, 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 they fall into different categories. Things like white-tailed eagles are inspirational. We've had them twice here in the farm, feeding on our carrion tables. And I am never thought, never considered at all, that we'd be blessed with their presence in my lifetime. I hope that storks will be here soon, and I hope that cranes will come as well. But in the end, I know that the curlews are things of the past, and, and we are dealing with a new kind of nature. So when it comes to what we do next, I mean, we had a quick chat earlier on about, about wildcats. The problem with wildcats is not that we, they're, they, they fall into a category of creatures that we've just killed. We've killed and exterminated them in the past because we wanted to preserve rabbits. We wanted rabbit for reasons that are all gone. We could live with them again. I like the Wildlife Trust. I work with them commonly. They're a decent-minded bunch of organisations. And just to take one step back to beavers, they were the first. John McAllister, the guys in Kent Wildlife Trust in 2000, stood robustly beside the idea of restoring this animal to Ham Fen a decade before anything happened in Scotland. So you have people within the organisation who are truly inspirational, and if they're supported well, they are capable of doing good things. Wildcats. The problem with wildcats is not that we don't have wildcat habitat. We know that we've got an abundance of cats. We've been to Holland. We've looked at what they've done there. The problem is not the fact that we could do it. The problem is politics. And the politics of the cats are that we, for, for the last, I don't know, 10 years, we've talked to the guys in Scotland about releasing cats from a stud book for programmes in England, and they're just resolutely refusing to do that. So when it comes to reintroductions, they're complicated quite commonly, not just by habitats, but also by the circumstances of the people who govern what you can and can't do with them. And frankly, that's shameful. If we're going to move to a new era, which people want us to do with children and good hearted folk who own land and who are really worried about what's happening, we need to start to get tougher about this and we need to start to look in a very focused way about what the real obstructions are, because if we don't address those, we don't make any progress. Brilliant, Derek. Thank you very much. And you expected well, that from me, didn't you? Yeah, I would have been very disappointed. This is why we both got you on, don't <laughs> worry. Uh, but very, thank you very much for that. And we're, you're getting a good reaction here, Derek. Uh, Young Blooms has said, I've just read Derek's book about beavers utterly fascinating so you might be recommending another book uh derek but actually people are reacting to it ali morse has said like others i've just read bringing back the beaver there were bits that made me laugh out loud and bits that made me genuinely tearful if you haven't read it i highly recommend it uh kerry richardson has says i think derek is one of my new favorite humans goodness uh, <laughs> yeah. well she's never never smelled uh, my so socks but what i will say <laughs> is that when i look to the europeans the Europeans are a quarter of a century in front of us in thinking. When you look at Britain, what you look at is an island that has been totally dominated by people since the Bronze Age. We are not, Rob, you, you're good at statistics. You've got a big brain. We are not like, what, what, what are we now? We're like out of 240 nations. Are we 218th or 228th in, the term of, in terms of depleted biology? It's one of the other figures. We are endgame. 
We are what happens when people basically dominate everything and completely control a landscape. That's why we worry about releasing tiny, tiny butterflies and little bits of moss and a little lichen here and, and, and you know, a beetle somewhere else. Honestly, we're an international laughing stock. And it's not because we can't do it. It's because 23 million acres of this island are farmed and we've never had any great degree of sincere argument about it because the people that <laughs> decide what happens in politics have until now, as you know perfectly well, Craig, decided that's the way it should be. And we're, we're arguing about maybe 50,000 acres that we might rewild. How, 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 how small an aspiration is that? But it's changing. We live in a remarkable time where these reintroductions of pine martens and cranes and white-tailed eagles and beavers are happening in our lifetime and where people are looking to us to do better. And we can. And that's the vision that we have to hold on to firmly. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Derek, I always find it amazing to think as well that uh, much as reintroductions can sometimes be controversial, I've always found myself thinking if we hadn't lost these species, you know, if we still had wolves and bears and bison in the UK, you know, would the British public really be after exterminating them? No, I think the British public would be very, very keen to see them protected. So I think that tells you what we really need to know. Anyway, you can respond to this as well. We want to do a poll um, and uh, which the poll, the question you're going to have, and this is a very difficult one because I hate to say it, but you can only pick one. We're after your top choice. Which of the following would you like to see reintroduced to the UK? Wildcat, lynx, bison, or wolf? Now, I would want to see all of those reintroduced fine, but you've got to think carefully. Uh, which of the ones do you want to tick uh, most? And we'll, we'll give you the results back later. That'll just be a little bit of fun. I think Obviously, there should be a, a, a box for all of the above, but I'm afraid there's not. So you just have to pick one. But uh, anyway, see, we're, we're fascinated to see what you think. So do answer in the poll now. So, OK, let's get into the open discussion. And we've had loads and loads of questions coming in here. Um, before we just go to the questions, I want to come back to Rob as our very own uh, expert from the Wildlife Trust. Just Rob, do you just reflect a little bit on what you've heard from Derek, from Misha, from Sally and Marina. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, uh, it's just, it just actually gives me great hope. I mean, you know, you've got with Sally and the Wild Wood Trust and, and 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 a lot of the zoos. I mean, if you take the bison as an example, you know, so bison were virtually extinct in Europe. So they were extinct as a wild animal in Europe, down to just twenty seven pairs in nineteen twenty eight or something like that. So, you know, and the the zoos and the parks. Um, set up a captive breeding program. I mean, you can't imagine, you know, amazing what they were doing back in the 20s, setting up that captive breeding program. Um, the first reintroductions into places like Belarus and, uh, and Poland, by the Vesia Forest, for example. We've now got bison back in um, uh, in Romania with Marina's work. Um, we've got bison back in the Netherlands. You know, now, you know, the Netherlands are a more densely populated country than the UK. Um, you know, the, the land use is more intensive than the UK, and we've got bison back in uh, Netherlands nature reserves. There's no reason whatsoever that we couldn't have bison uh, here in the UK, and it's just fantastic that the Kent Wildlife Trust are going to bring them back into into suburban Kent, which I just think is absolutely fantastic. No offence to Kent. Um, so, you know, we can see the value of the sort of work that Sally's doing. You can see the examples from places like Romania, places like Ukraine, the work that uh, Derek is doing, that this is all possible. But Derek's point's really, really valid. We need to scale up introduction, you know, so we need beavers in every river system, not just a couple. Not Let's not argue forever about what's going on in the River Tay. We need beavers back everywhere. We need sphagnum back on every blanket block, and we've got to stop burning them. It's absolutely ridiculous to burn a blanket bog. You know, a unique, unique habitat to the UK. You know, we're one of the top places on earth to find blanket bog and we allow people to burn them. Come on, let's get sphagnum, a keystone species, back on those blanket bogs. Lynx return to all our major forests. This is all possible. We could even have wolves in the UK. People think that's utterly impossible. Wolves are back in Belgium. Wolves are back in Belgium. If they can be back in Belgium, of course they can be back in the UK. 
And we know that wolves are incredibly shy animals that stick to themselves and not going to cause too many problems. So, you know, all of that is possible. It feels to me there's a momentum building out there, you know, that young people are starting to demand nature's recovery. And I think politicians need to wake up to this. Stop putting in place bureaucracy that stops all of these reintroductions and make it easy. I'm really interested what this government, this English government's going to do in terms of the, um, the beaver consultation that's just come out. I want to see government come out of a system that makes it easy for us to reintroduce beavers. Of course, deal with the issues and so on, but makes it easy for us to reintroduce beavers so that we can benefit from the amazing wildlife that we see in places like Ukraine and Romania here in the UK. Great. Thank you, Rob, very much. So there we have it. You know, if you want walls back in the UK, we just have to get them a ticket for Eurostar and then they'll be here pretty much. I'd love to just go first of all to Misha and Marina. I mean, for you guys listening into this conversation about rewilding in the UK and obviously the fact that the UK is an island nation and it does mean, you know, you have to make uh, really conscious choices about species reintroductions here. I mean, what 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 are your sort of reflections on this? This is this is why it is a bit of a different story for us in the UK to, to parts of continental Europe. Okay, I will start. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, yeah, I uh, I knew about your plans uh, from uh, the media about um, reintroducing bison in UK, uh, and of course, um, it's a total, it's a big, big difference from Romanians to to UK. Uh, first of all. Um, um, it's in my opinion bringing bison in UK it will increase biodiversity but you won't have a viable population because you don't have enough uh, habitat for that but increasing uh, uh, biodiversity in semi-free uh, spaces and in all maybe in the future um, uh, replicating um, the reintroduction in other parts in UK, it will increase uh, the overall biodiversity in the country. Uh, to have a viable population, it's much more complicated. You need to have a meta population. Even in the Carpathians, we have a lot of challenges to create this meta population because even we have great nature here and the wilderness still. Uh, the impact of human pressure is there. It's uh, forest logging, it's hunting. Um, a lot of rivers uh, are affected by uh, dams, uh, all kinds of dams and so on. And uh, we don't have con uh, all the time uh, the best connectivities uh, uh, from on different, uh, in different areas. So, there's a lot of work even in the Carpathians to create a meta population with a viable um, uh, number. So, but in my opinion, the, the effort it's worth uh, to do it because still will contribute to, to um, uh, increasing the biodiversity. And if um, you pay very much attention to quality of uh, genetics of the animals, you can create source of bison for source of animals for introducing this animal in other parts of Europe because that's it's also a very very big challenges uh, challenge in the uh, reintroduction program. Um, bison reintroduction in the Southern Carpathians it was a pilot program because it's the first program which basically takes bison from across breeding centers from Europe. Uh, in Poland, in Belarus, all uh, the source of the bison are coming from their own source and time to time they improved that uh, um, genetics. But we are having um, at this point based on um, DNA uh, analysis, which is using a new method uh, developed in 2020. It's proven that the Romanian uh, bison uh, population has the uh, highest uh, genetic diversity at this moment. So you can do that. You can replicate that in UK and then create source of animals for other introduction programs in Europe, 
which is a, a big effort and it can be a key to conserve the species overall, the, to improve the, the uh, status of the species uh, in Europe. Right, yeah. And Misha, what about your reflection on just hearing this debate from the from the UK, you know, quite a different context to where you're operating in Ukraine? Yeah, well, my, my, my advice would be, or my experience, because you have to take the opportunity wherever it exists. In, in our cases, I think Romania and Ukraine, we take the opportunity of the public lands, where you have the large areas where you can start. Of course, we understand very well the whole complexity of the journey from just the moment you release the first group of animals to the future where we would say we have a viable population that is able to reproduce genetically diverse and, and sustainable. We understand it's a long way, but we have to start somewhere and then generate this experience. There's no experience very much in Europe who can tell you kind of plot all your way, all your steps towards this future. I mean, because the, the species are various and, and the experiences are various. And, and like our program with Kula, no one has ever done it in Europe. We never even know, we didn't even know whether or not they would stay put and migrate hundreds of kilometers. So you have to start somewhere and it's a long way. Um, but also, I mean, from our experience, it's really important to get connection with the local people and they have what they're thinking and they're, what they believe. And and then and then and communicates with them. I mean, most of the projects, and I heard some of the projects from UK. That was the breaking moment when you start communicating with the local people what you want to do. But before you before you start communicating, you have to know yourself what you want to do, what's the future, where you want to go before you may lead anyone. And I think it's very important for you to again kind of understand yourself, imagine what where you want to go. And well, in our cases, like for instance, in some of the communities, they have this beautiful wilderness, which was completely stripped of all the large uh, wildlife. I mean, there's well, there's some flowers, of course, and the butterflies. And then, and then on the community, if you look at the economy, I mean, they they haven't had any income from this nature. They have no interest in this nature. And we said, well, why don't we bring back the large animals and then generate some something, which is. Anyway, additional to what you're doing, it doesn't really jeopardize your agriculture, whatever you do. This is something new and exciting. And, and for some of the people, they, they start kind of sharing your ideas and, and, and things. And it's a lot of, I mean, it's, there's a lot of conservation challenges, but there are also a lot of social, social challenges as well in all these programs. And I think so let's get into those. Uh, we've had a few questions on exactly this topic, and um, my sense is they might trigger you a little bit, Derek, so that could be entertaining. Um, Ian Townsend <laughs> Ian Townsend has said, Derek, exclamation mark, can we get UK biodiversity into a much better shape and still feed ourselves without importing more and more food? Jack Bedford has asked, how do we encourage reintroductions, especially predators, while strengthening our relationship with farmers who might be concerned. We need our farmers to help steward a renewed wilder landscape. Laura Fiander has said, most farmers and landowners don't even allow foxes on their land and encourage the hunt to dispatch them. How are we going to expect them to allow lynx, etc.? Derek, let's go to you for a nice calm reaction to that. Okay, well, I hope you're not to be sorry you asked the question, okay? Before we start, what I'll say, I'll say as you look at the Europeans, I have spent so many nights drinking honey, vodka, and a variety of other things in the best bars in the world, in obscure forests with the most delightful people. And the thing that I find most disappointing all of all is we don't learn from them. You know, you, you have the best brains out there who have dealt with issues which are significantly overcome everything we have to deal with and where blueprints have been developed and where you've just got decency and respect. I don't know why you people are so kind to us. Uh, it never ceases to amaze me that you're so decent. We owe you so much. Right, why are we where we are? Right. Well, when it comes to most farmers who won't allow foxes in their land, it's because we're still basically dealing with a mindset 
that is medieval. You know, anything that takes anything from us, we slaughter it. That's our response. And if you think that's wrong, then you look at the, the YouTube videos that were there before Christmas where you've got two people with a wee terrier catching a fox and trying to stab it to death with a garden fork. Garden forks have got blunt tines. You can't stab something to death with a garden fork. That's the way of thinking we applied to the wolf when we exterminated them a thousand years ago. Of course, living with nature is going to mean changing mindsets, but we have a mindset that we've hardly challenged. And this change and, and this then applies to things like beavers. You know, beavers are they're not something that's dark, they're not something that's scary. They re-wet land and and they make it hard to farm areas of land that probably we shouldn't be farming anyway. You know, if you look at the flooding we've had over the last few days, the floodings come because we again and our tiny island try to use every area of land there is. And what it means is that there's no soaks, there are no wetlands, there's nothing to slow the flow at all. It's just open raw fields, you know, full of sheep on turnips that run into rivers and then go straight down to flood the villages, the primary schools, the police stations, the bus stations that impose, impose a huge amount of misery on wider society well, for nothing. I've got the statistics. I spent last week at Ewhurst, Craig. I don't know if you've been there looking at the rewilding project there, but I could tell you that of the farming community that actually feed us, we as something like some 17,000 farmers produce 70% of the food we consume in Britain. There are all sorts of statistics that back that. And when you actually start to look at land use in Britain, you know, we're we're farming 70% of our wheat crop or our grain crop goes to feed livestock. It's a completely bonker system. We're, we're basically subsidising an industry that was set up after the Second World War when our merchant navy was being sunk in such huge numbers that the island could starve and people were growing potatoes uh, on the lawn in Buckingham Palace. That finished 80 years ago, and yet that's what's still in our heads. And it's exploited, quite frankly, if you want to be honest, by bullies, by people that basically shout at you and threaten this is going to happen without any kind of evidence to suggest it is and then tell you you can't reduce a beaver because one day it'll eat carrots or a water vole or whatever else. To finish on this, I'll just leave you with a little laugh. We have been moving beavers from the tea. Maybe we have saved 60, 70 beavers, and many of your wildlife trusts have helped us to do that. Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust, Derbyshire Wildlife Trust, Dorset Wildlife Trust, decent people trying to help with nothing much. We're moving them because the politicians in Scotland and other conservation organisations that really should know better have supported this policy of slaughter and kill. We're killing animals that would do a lot of good. We're killing animals that would slow the flow. We're killing animals that would restore biodiversity. But we save a few. When we save a few, we're saving them from the guys that don't like beavers eating carrots. OK, I'll make this simple. Those carrots that the farmers harvest on the tay are being harvested on floodplain. If you hadn't drained the land, you couldn't grow carrots. Carrots like sandy soil. Carrots don't like water. When they've harvested their carrots, they send it to supermarkets. The supermarkets sell a percentage of their carrots, and a percentage of their carrots that don't last long on the shelves, that get slimy, then go to, they're just dumped, they're given to zoos, they're given to people that can use them for other purposes. The zoos, one of the zoos that gets them feeds their carrots to the beavers that we are trying to rescue, and then we move those small po that small population of beavers using their carrots to feed them down to other parts of the UK. We are a small and absurd island, and we need to really start rethinking very carefully how we're going to do this. And to get to that point, we need organisations at the Wildlife Trust to listen very clearly to all the wee people that are trying to do good and help us. Because we're really small. You guys have a voice. It's easy to crush us. And unless we work together, we can't achieve very much.
Thank you, Derek. I thought I might provoke you there. Uh, we've got lots of comments coming in. Sue Fowler said, Misha is right. You have to start somewhere, but starting would be good. And that includes, as I said earlier, really starting to do something about the current wildlife loss here. Um, Tanya has said, um, education is really important. Many predators are maligned and have a bad press. There needs to be better education regarding keystone species. Helen Bird has said, yes, Derek, we need we need to eat the crops, not feed them to animals taking up yet another field. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 another Tanya said, we have a mindset that we can control every inch of nature and that's the problem. Uh, keep the questions uh, coming in. Uh, lots of you said you've absolutely loved those videos. Um, uh, there's also a comment here, uh, if I can just find back to it. Um, there's also a comment um, that, uh, oh, here we are, this is, it's from Matt Cordner. It says, I do agree, but I think rewilding has become a laundering exercise for large foreign corporations for their own financial and carbon offsetting benefits. Surely it could be done in a better manner. So I think we would all agree in this panel, wouldn't we? It's, it's critically important that rewilding is done, is driven by and has the support of local communities. This is incredibly important, isn't it, to drive it. Um, Rob, can you say a little bit more why at the Wildlife Trust, we certainly think it's hugely important to have that community engagement and involvement in rewild, rewilding programs. Yeah, and absolutely. And you've heard some brilliant examples from mainland Europe, you know, both in, um, I mean, only because I used to work for Rewilding Europe and, and know Misha and, Marina, but both in the Ukraine and in the Romanian uh, Carpathians, is those rewilding activities have been done with community support. In fact, you know, I mean, in uh, in the Carpathians, you know, it's the local mayor that's championing, or was the local mayor that was championing bison reintroduction because he could see the the tourism benefits that would result from the bite the reintroduction of bison. And we need to have exactly the same mindset here in the UK. So bison, you know, so rewilding is sometimes talked about as if, you know, we're going to remove people from the land. Oh, that's absolute nonsense. Rewilding is about actually bringing people back to the land. If you go to the highlands of Scotland, you know, where, you know, a lot of people were removed from the land in the 19th century or the 18th century in the, in the highland clearances, you know, rewilding offers an approach where people can come back to those communities, where people can come back to that land. And they'll come back to that land not through industries that employ very few people, but industries like tourism that em employ lots and lots of people. And that's definitely possible. And we've seen rewilding, you know, so rewilding Britain, for example, have looked at, um, you know, what's happened on the pieces, on the projects where rewilding's happened. And they've seen an increase in employment, an increase in volunteering, and often an increase in profit from that land. So the NEP estate, would have employed just a few farm assistants and the farm manager when it was a, a, a mixed arable farm. It now employs, you know, tens and tens of people in in the safari business, in the meat business, in, and so on. You know, and that's the sort of vision that we can see for the environment. So, you know, if you read Rebirding, it talks about the Somerset Levels being completely restored for its nature. It talks about, you know white storks and pelicans and and you know wild cattle and wild horses across that wetland landscape so imagine that you know imagine how that would drive the prosperity of that part of the world no longer worrying about flooding farmland actually seeing floods as a benefit um no longer you know scraping a living out of digging out peat and pouring that into the carbon uh, into the atmosphere as e excess carbon actually making a living from keeping that peat wet fantastic you know so the the cultural prosperity of that area which is obvious you know glastonbury and all the rest of it allied to natural prosperity in in that rewilded landscape so rewilding is a is a solution to um rural poverty and and rural um degeneration that we're seeing in some parts of thing imagine if the cambrian mountains for example you know was rewilded think what that environment would look like think what the tourism possibilities would be you know if you go to the central cambrian mountains you now it's not a big tourist area but it could be can i can i say something craig on, you wanted us to make this more 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 feisty at the beginning two things one rob got it wrong it's not tens of people rob 
it's hundreds of people. They're employing more people on the Nepa state now than worked there in the 16th century. And the second thing I'd like to say, well, I'll say three things. Second one is when it comes to, 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 to wildlife spectacles, we have few in Britain. We have seabird communities off the coast and that's about it. And it, But if you think that's humble, then you look at the history of Yellowstone. Now, I don't know, I assume you're all well-read people, but for the last few years, um, myself and a bunch of colleagues have been lecturing in the United States. We didn't understand it that well, but Yellowstone is really interesting. See, when you see those pictures of bison standing next to geezers and wapiti and moose and all that sort of stuff, those animals a century ago were all dead. They came from a zoo that was there in the 1920s. And gradually, the, 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 the National Park Service relaxed its hold on it. So in the 1920s, this zoo would, for the tourists, run a staged Indian hunt of bison, whereby the Indians on the, the reserve came to the zoo, chased the bison round a big pen, put on their war paint, and the tourists all clapped politely. When you guys are looking at this in Europe and saying this might be something that's worth thinking about, you look to the United States and you look in detail at the creation of spectacles completely by chance. And that's what we need to do, because people are not going to come to a landscape where the spectacle is a crane fly in the distance or... Nothing at all. Nothing, nothing, because the landscape is dead. And I'll finish on this final thought. Beavers are binary. I have stood with your people in community centres. And people talk a lot of times about communities in the countryside. And what you don't understand is I farm and the communities here only unite when there is a threat. And the threat is George Mombio with his little thick owl-like glasses blinking at you in a sinister fashion. And and the RPA and Natural England, because everybody hates them, and all this sort of stuff. The communities, the communities, other people, the people who are not farmers, never have a voice. Nobody listens to them. They just pay their damn taxes and 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 are expected to stand the floods and the disasters that farming delivers to them without even whining at all. The beaver thing changed everything. Because when those beavers appeared in the River Otter and they appeared in the Tay, they didn't appear because it was an official reintroduction or the Wildlife Trust put them there or the RSPB did or the National Trust or Scottish Natural Heritage got itself off its arse and organised it. They appeared because people let them go. And then they had to ask those people what they wanted to do. I have never been so moved in my life as I was in a hall that the, where the Wildlife Trust stood and, and arranged an evening uh, symposia about what should happen to the beavers. It was humbling. There was a nine-year-old girl stood up and gave a presentation which was breathtakingly brilliant. She'd studied beavers and what beavers do on the internet and she stood up there and said how moved she was. These creatures from the English Dark Ages were felling the trees at the bottom of her grandmother's garden and when that wee girl sat down, 200 people stood up and clapped. They had a voice. It's about democracy. The things that basically dictate what we do with this land, the decisions that are made are made in closed rooms by people who don't ask us what we want to do. And as nature conservation organisations, we should be saying that's wrong. We don't represent people until we basically stand back and say no. And that's, that's where we need to be not appeasing, not trying to seek some sort of function that makes it coercive and cosy, but no, because they're with us and they're not, they're not for the bad things that happen. They want to see change. Thank you, Derek. Well, we certainly have been asking people tonight for their views on issues. Uh, we polled you a little while ago. We said, which of the following would you most like to see reintroduced to the UK. We asked you wildcat, lynx, bison or wolf and I can reveal now the answers to this. 
uh, I think there's a lot of support for all of them. And it's actually more evenly spread than I might have thought tonight. Um, I'm sorry to say Sally Wildcat came out slightly lowest, but still very popular at 19%. 90% of the audience said they would love to see Wildcat reintroduced. Uh, next up was Wolf at 23%, then Bison at 24%. 24% of you said Bison. Remember, you could only choose one, and as I said, I would choose all four. But anyway, and top was Lynx, uh, 33%. So, you know, if not Wildcat, at least you've got a cat in there, Sally, so you can <laughs> feel good about that as, as Lynx up top. What do you make of that, Sally? Can you, do you want to try and convince the audience about what, uh, I think they all know what beautiful animals wildcats are but tell us a bit more about just how special wildcats are yeah i'm happy with the lynx as well i think um any kind of wildcat is is good for me so lynx i'm happy with that result and i think again it goes to show how much how much work is really being done about um having the lynx having the idea of reintroducing the lynx as well the lynx as well and and uh, so that's good news really um but yeah the wildcat i think it's, it's going to gain a lot more momentum um, especially in the next few years, I think people are going to hear a lot more about the conservation projects going going on, and hopefully that will um, encourage people that are to want them back in the wild throughout the UK. Um, they're just an amazing species. You know, they, they used to roam all over the UK, as I said earlier, and my opinion, I think they do deserve the right to to reside all over Britain, not just Scotland. And this is exactly why we're doing what we're doing here at Wilded and the project that we're part of. Um, with Daryl Wildlife Conservation Trust and Vincent Wildlife Trust um, in a bid to try and re-establish a self-sustaining population of wildcats outside of Scotland. Um, and then hopefully, you know, you never know, we don't know the timeline yet, but hopefully within the next sort of 15 to 20 years, it will be nice that a wildcat population is existing and dispersing um, in the release areas that we're looking at. But um, yeah, I, I think they're brilliant and, you know, they're they provide a purpose. They will, said earlier again, they're balancing out ecosystems. They're increasing biodiversity. They're keeping um, prey numbers in check. And most importantly, also another competition for predators as well, so foxes too. So, you yeah, know, they, they have a purpose. And um, it's certainly with, and I said earlier about um, talking to local communities, making sure they're engaged and just making sure we're doing the right steps and working together. There's a few of us that want to reintroduce the wildcat across Britain and it's just really important that we share our experience and our best practices to make sure that there's a better chance of success to this species. Well, can I just say that, one thing? You're being after, really polite about I'm going to put a couple of questions though. You can come in in a second. I'm just going to throw a couple of other questions in because we've got a lot here. So, um, and to all of you, there's a lot of questions about cats really. Um, there's about both wildcat reintroductions and about reintroduction of lynx. Um, we had uh, Laura Fianda said, problem with introducing lynx is that they wouldn't have a natural predator. How would the population lynx then be controlled? Would they end up being uh, an annual cull in years to come? Uh, someone else has said, the wildcat reintroduction worries me from someone who works at a wildlife hospital. What drastic effect will wildcats have on population of our beloved native bird species? And there are also a few questions about how they would interact with domestic cats and in gardens and so on. So Sally, Derek, Rob, whoever, uh, uh, Misha Marina, anyone want to sort of shed some light on that, those kind of inter interactions between cats and other species? Okay, can I say something? I've been to see the Dutch about wild cats. I was not, and we've been to see the Bavarians. We have spent the best part of eight years talking about this. I spoke to Pete Burgess today, um, this morning about wild cat. Um, we're moving on with wild cats in England. Burgess, for people that don't know, people Burgess Devon is Wildlife Devon Trust. Wildlife Trust. Yeah. yeah, we're keen to do it. We're keen to do it together. It's a small animal. Why on earth are we arguing or even debating the restoration of a small animal that was slaughtered by gamekeepers less than a century ago? It's ridiculous. If this is a global emergency, if we're looking at you know extinction meltdown, these things we should be delivering fast. Ten years. Absolutely not. I've spent way too long in meetings listening to people saying there are complications. We're going to have to wait five years, 10 years, three years. Well, it's nothing. At the end of the day, what you've got to do is have 50 of them in a box and let them go. And when it comes to communities, you're commonly 
you are asking people about what their feelings are about an animal they know nothing of, nothing at all. If you gave them a crayon that was black and you gave them a crayon that was brown, they couldn't draw you a wild cat on a piece of white paper for their mother's life. At the end of it all, we need to advise people on the basis of something that's sentient and we need to move on. It's Rob. And it's got a lot to do with politics, but the landscape is fine for wildcats. We need to move on with this and then look at bigger challenges. I think with um, with the work we're doing with Daryl and Vincent as well, the habitats that we're looking at and the, and the areas that we'd like to select, we are making sure that the prey density is there for the cat to survive. And, and some of you may or may not know, but their main prey source is rabbit. So we're looking at the, the rabbit densities in the area and other small mammals as well. So hopefully mitigate the issue of them catching um, and of birds, you know, particularly ones that are quite rare. Birds are about 9% yeah. of their diet. We don't know whether they'll take carrion or not. But I'm chatting to Laura on Thursday that we have some new and interesting information on this. The birds are not significant. You need lots of rabbits, lots of grey squirrels and lots of small mammals. And beavers deliver lots of small mammals. There is no need for pessimism on wild cats. We can do this really easily. And if we can't do a wild cat, how on earth are we going to do a bison? You know, it's it's yeah, you know, it's again a binary thing. But if you look at European experience and the challenges you guys face, we're just we're just arguing about the dust in the corner of a room. So yeah, let's uh, we've we've got comments on this also coming in on the chat. We've had Peter Cooper said we know from Europe that wild cats actively avoid human habitation on the whole, yeah. including gardens. Yeah, there's. Uh, I and actually, they're saying, unlike badgers and foxes. So, so look, I, I'm sorry to say we are fast running out of time. So I want to come to all of you with a final kind of question, really. I want to ask, ask you to think big. How far, looking across re rewilding across Europe and looking across, uh, yeah, rewilding across Europe, particularly in the UK as well, particularly for those of us in the UK, and the trajectory we've been on in the last sort of 10, 20 years. You know, we've seen wolves coming back to the Netherlands. Uh, we've seen, as, as Rob was saying, many species back in, in uh, wolves in the Netherlands, in Belgium even. And obviously some huge progress in parts of Eastern Europe on this. Just how far might we be able to go across Europe as a whole in the next 50 years? And for those of us based in the UK, if you want to ask as well, what's your vision for how, where we could be in 50 years time? But let's start, first of all, with uh, Misha. Why don't you kick us off? What would be your vision of where we could get to across Europe or Central and Eastern Europe in 50 years? Well, I think Eastern Europe would be slightly different from the Western Europe. And in the Western Europe, we clearly have um, a land abandonment issue. There's a lot of lands being abandoned and, and just people leaving the countryside. This is giving you a huge opportunity for rewilding of these areas and building up indeed. The new economy is for the people who come back to the countryside in many of the parts of the Western Europe. In Eastern Europe, particularly in the Ukraine, we see slightly different trends. I mean, in, in increase in the agriculture, we have very productive black soils and then demand for agricultural big companies. And here, was, as I believe, I mean, the, the most momentum would come from coexistence of the society with the wildlife. And they see very good and auspicious signs of but this is happening. We're getting used to living alongside with the wildlife and the big wildlife, which is, I think, will be very important for, for the future. And I think we can do a lot. You see how many projects and just even the private initiatives are popping up everywhere across the Europe. The movement is growing. And I think it's very exciting. I think there's a lot of room. And where the room is will be slightly different across the Europe. And and the wild cats, they live in the delta and they never come to the settlements. I've never heard of them coming to the settlements, so no worries about them. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Uh, Sally, what would be your vision? How far could we go? So in the next 50 years, potentially in the UK, um, I think it'd be great to see that wildcat reintroduction is, is working and it's doing well and, and across different areas in the UK as well. 
not just maybe a couple. Um, it would be nice that the Scottish population is, has been bolstered and again is surviving with little human intervention. Um, bison, I think that would be amazing. I, I think that's, that's uh, quite likely um, that they are performing really well. Um, and I think we touched on it, but maybe even lynx, I'd like to think at least those talks on the lynx reintroduction have come a bit further and potentially even have the very early makings of a reintroduction project there and, and maybe talking about captive breeding and the very early stages of that, but uh, yeah. Good. Um, uh, Rob, what about you? What would be your big vision of where we could get to in 50 years? Yeah, I mean, I think we're at a really, really interesting time in the UK. You know, agriculture has gone wrong in the UK. Uh, you know, it's, it's destroyed wildlife. Um, it, it contributes huge amount of emissions to the atmosphere. And it's a very small part of our economy. And that, that can't be right. Most of our land has been used for animal feed and biofuel. Uh, and not to feed ourselves. So, you know, we need to start to um, reform agriculture. And I think we're at the beginning of that. And I think the government has been actually quite brave in starting to reform agriculture in terms of public payments for public goods, you know, through the Agriculture Act and so on. They've got to stick to that. And this is going to be really fundamental. Now, if that happens, we see agriculture transition, which means that some of the areas of Britain, especially the marginal soils of Britain, I'm thinking in the West and so on, um, we can we can envisage much much bigger wilder areas, and these bigger wilder areas can be can be managed with wild cattle, wild horses, wild boar, deer, of course, beavers. You know that these are the keystone species that are going to manage that, and we'll see a return of wildlife abundance. And in that wildlife abundance, we can bring back the apex predators of wild cat and lynx for sure. That's relatively straightforward. And why not wolves? And why not bears? Eventually. Good. I wanted you to mention bears, otherwise I've been really unhappy. Um, Marina, how, how far do you think we can go across particularly Central and Eastern Europe? Uh, I don't know too much about uh, UK to say what will be in 50 years, but what I can say is that rewilding is not an option anymore for us as human beings. It, it is a must. So it's not about just reintroducing some animals in the wilderness. It's about creating, restoring the natural processes. It's about. It's not about mitigating conflicts. It's about coexistence. It's about learning to live with wildlife. It's about understanding the value of our uh, nature and also uh, about you know um, bringing traditional values back to life. If we we are doing this in uh, Carpathians, and it is amazing. If you want to book an experience, come here and to see how you can see bison rooming in a huge habitat, and you just can walk on a road and see the bear, which are running away from you. It's not coming towards you to eat you or just to produce some damages. Uh, uh, wildlife is shy. It's not coming to you if it's not bothered, and you can see how people are involved in rewilding activities by putting their materials, uh, building houses for accommodation, um, locals bringing traditional activities back to life, building in a way which have been done for centuries in Romania, uh, tasting the food which is grown in the, full, in the field of the people, and then working, going in the field with hunters because we are involved in hunters in traditional, um, in the ecotourism activities, discussing with children because they are the future of, uh, of our community and they are just involved as much as possible as uh, adults in our activities. So I'm sure it will change your mind, it will change the public mind in the UK if just seeing uh, the difference uh, what means basically to have uh, biodiversity and I'm proud of, of this because basically bison have been reintroduced in one of the wildest area in Europe. So do that. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. And uh, yeah, I would love to get to the Carpathians to see that at some point. Uh, Derek, what's your vision? How, where could we get to across Europe and the UK specifically over 50 years? Well, I'd like to say the Carpathians are beautiful. I've been there. The slugs in the Carpathians are blue. 
blue in a way you'd never imagine. It's a remarkable landscape. Where are going to we going to be? God only knows. We are capable of doing great things, but we're also capable of spending 50 years on chit-chat and achieving nothing. At the end of it all, the reason why you have a land use sector that is completely dominated by agriculture in the main doing huge and significant damage is because nobody else has a voice. We all know it to be true, Craig. You know it as well as I do. And if we're going to change this, we're going to have to look at all of us growing up and all of us saying, in this time of change, you should get no more public money for doing exactly what you're going to do. On Friday, I sat down with one of the ministers. He is telling me that, uh, that the third, third and third for nature improvement is not going to stand and that the government will give in to a process which delivers much more money back to farmers for doing bugger all with nature conservation tourism. No other industry in this landscape has a ch had a chance to flourish because we give it to agriculturalists who destroy everything and who insist that their way of right is primal and right without any kind of intelligence or historic perspective being applied to that. We're going to need to fight harder. But people, we talked about young people. Young people, we don't involve at all in these conversations. It's their future. It's their world. They can see through this utter nonsense. And the Wildlife Trust, the RSPB, the National Trust, the big voices in this nature conservation sector need to insist that it's not just us sitting there, it's other people with other points of view that are going to carry us forward. And that's going to be painful and difficult for us all, but it's the right thing to do. <laughs> thank you, Derek, very much. OK, thank you all for those wonderful visions for where we're going to get to, uh, where we need to get to over the next 50 years. Uh, if you want to hear sort of a different range of debates about agriculture as well, don't forget that, of course, we have all kinds of previous wild lives that you can watch on Catch Up. And in particular, we had a wild life in December 2020 that was about the future of farming here in the UK. That was with uh, Minette Batters from the National Farmers Union, amongst others as well as many others, also government officials as well, talking about future agricultural policy. We debated that back in December 2020. Uh, there was all kinds of things being promised then. Some of them have come come through and some not uh, to date. Exactly. Uh, we are at the Wildlife Trust. We've said very clearly over the last couple of months that on the whole, we've been pretty disappointed with uh, the progress about uh, changing agricultural policy in this country. We think there's a lot more that the government needs to do to really make sure that we have agricultural policy that allows nature to be put into recovery. And we're not there yet a long way. Uh, so you can look back at that at previous Wild Lives to watch. Also, keep an eye on the Wildlife Trust website and social media feeds for more detail in the next couple of weeks about the next episode of Wild Live in March. We're just firming up the details of that at the moment, but we're pretty excited with what it's going to look like. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, well, as soon as it's firmed up, we will let you know. But I want to finish tonight, of course, by saying a huge thank you to our amazing panel. Uh, Rob Stoneman, of course, Director of Landscape Recovery at the Wildlife Trust. Sally Holt, uh, project lead of ex situ wildcat conservation at the Wildwood Trust. Uh, Misha Nestorenko, uh, rewilding program manager at Rewilding Ukraine, and Marina Juga, program manager at WF Romania, uh, Romania. And of course, Derek Gao, of course, reintroduction expert, farmer, and author there. It's been great to have you all join us. Didn't the time run fast because we were having such a good conversa uh, conversation? It was a really great conversation. And I'll leave you just again with this one thought. Uh, we've heard there about the amazing vision from all our experts there about where we can get to over the next 50 years. And sometimes, yes, species reintroductions can be controversial. But I mean, as I said earlier, to my mind, the thing to really think through, these are species, are, they should be part of our landscape. They are just as much part of, in our case, Britain as Shakespeare or any other bit of our culture. You know, they should be here. And if they were still here, whether you're talking 
wolves, you're talking lynx, wildcat, bison, or even bears, if they were still there here, would the British public support eradication them? I don't think so. And perhaps that tells us what we should be trying to do long term around bringing our wildlife back. Thank you very much for joining us tonight for this fantastic discussion. We'll see you at the next Wildlife. Good night.